morning to all of you. So today is the last plague of this discourses. And as I promised that for the first half an hour, I will touch upon the power amplifier, one of the important building blocks of any transceiver design. Then next one and a half, year, uh, half hour, I will be uh, giving you ideas of how to synthesize the frequency for a receiver and transmitter. And next one hour, I will give again an online hands-on experience of designing a PLL or a frequency synthesizers. So that is the uh, today's plan. So let me go into the power amplifier design. And as you know, this power amplifier design is a little bit of challenging in one term that it is very noisy and you know that in any society you know there are some people are very calm and quiet and somebody is not that and then how to manage the whole systems you know some people may be very much noisy and they the argumentative and somebody is very much cool and calm power amplifier is the second category so it has got huge power therefore makes not of noise and therefore integrate with the whole transceivers is a very challenging issue because it try to dominate over all the blocks for example i talked about the vco design and the vco the free running frequency say 2.4 gigahertz and then you will find your transmitter whatever the frequency which will be transmitted with the base band and if the power amplifier is nearby the VCO, then actually the power amplifier will rule over the VCO and the VCO starts oscillating with the frequency of the power amplifier. And that is a typical, you know, that frequency pull in effect. So it will pull the frequency uh, at the frequency of the power amplifier. <coughs> so these are, and also the electromagnetic interference and the power dissipation, all these things are quite uh, prominent or I would say that challenging in terms of the design things. So if you look at that, what is the trade-off is the supply voltage, the output power. There is a catch in it. In power amplifier design, the output deliverable power, the efficiency and its linearity these three important characteristics has to be understood very carefully because there is a huge interdependency among all these parameters. So if you want to deliver more power, you may have to sacrifice the linearity. When your power deliverables are not that high, then you can actually stress upon the linearity of that. I am giving an example. Suppose you are designing RF transmitters for your base station. While you are developing this for the base station, you need to transmit huge power. The kind of power amplifier you should choose where you have to deliver more power. So maybe your linearity would be questionable. Whereas in case of a simple cell phone design, you know that where power is very, very low, minus 87, minus 47 to uh, 119 dBm minus, where the power level is quite low, okay? And transmission is also not that huge, one microwatt like that. In that case, probably a linear amplifier, a class AB, normally all your amplifier which you are having in the GSM phone is class AB type amplifier. Whereas, you will find in your base stations or the bigger transmitters, these are all nonlinear one. It is class E or class F type of amplifier. So depending upon what is your requirements. So with this background, let us give a quick glimpses of the power amplifier. Half an hour is too short. And you know that you do not have initially the Texas Instruments developed its first transceiver chip and in 2000, beginning of 2000 I remember, they are using two voltage supply source, 1.8 for the transceiver 
excluding the power amplifier then they boosted the power amplifier in another voltage level of 3.3 volt but today's design those kind of design is not acceptable you need a single power supply so you need more efficiency in your design block so that is the challenging research zone at this moment and also the frequency you need the frequency to be very high for example now today is you are going for wlan applications where you require 5.73 kind of a gigahertz or say 3 to 7 gigahertz like a wide band so kind of power amplifier requirements you are increasing the frequency now so if you look at the puzzle box you have done the mixing part the filters the a to d converter then base band and similarly the the if signal goes and then it is from the digital domain to the analog domain and then it is filtered and fed to the mixer for up conversions and then through a switch it is going to the power amplifier and a matchbox so here is the the uh, the block which will now discuss so today this part and this part will look at it so you can synthesizer have a unique role you will find in this transmitter receiver chain this is the only block being used in the same platform so this is a common block <coughs> this is a very very latest okay, power amplifier management for example, I have a tri-band architecture. Normally, all your cell phone having the tri-band, okay? The GSM or DCS or PCS. This is today's technology that you have the LNA, free LNAs, and then mixer, and then your programmable gain amplifier, filters, A to D converter. Then you have this uh, chopper filters to avoid the one by F noise, then and so on like that. So you are getting both the in phase and the quad phase components of your uh, uh, receive signals. Similarly, from the base band, it is going into the mixing block for up conversions, and there is then further processing uh, with this uh, blocks, and then you know it is going to the amplifier, and then uh, it goes to the power amplifier, and finally transmitted to the antenna, and so on. So this is called multi-band kind of architecture of the phone, but no technology now is this domain that you need so many, so many blocks, each channel is having dedicated LNA. So there is obviously some scope for having one LNA which can serve as a tri-band uh, LNA structure. So only one LNA can hook up with 2.4 gig, 1.8 gigahertz, as well as the 950, this 950, 1.8, and say 1.2.4 uh, gig. So all this can be done in a single LNA, and those kind of architectures are being uh, at the moment under research, which is called tri-band LNA. Or you can have a wide-band LNA, where you have the 1 to 3 gigahertz or 3 to 7 gigahertz kind of wide-band LNA, and the mixer is essentially it is wide band in nature because it is nonlinear. So probably the designing of the wide band uh, mixer is not will, will be intrinsically not should not be that difficult rather than the LNA. And you can have the programmable amplifiers probably you need some sort of uh, approach because when you have down converted then you probably need uh, a narrow band to avoid the interchannel mixing. <coughs> then A to D converter, in my opinion uh, <coughs> that what will be the number of bits in the ATC and the typical conversion rate for the ATC design, which will be compatible for this uh, RF band. I say this 12 to 14 bit of Yonobi 11.73 would have been a better choice. Okay? 12 bit is good enough because if you actually if you decrease the bit count, or increase the bit count, you have both the effects. If you increase the bit count, then your resolution will be much high and where you need some kind of an amplifier so that you had boost the signal so that A to D converter will work in the linear region. But you know that if you want to reduce the bit count, then probably you will lose the, uh, the, there is the resolutions of your uh, baseband signals. 
So, therefore, the optimum ADC should be around 12 bit. Now, look at here this uh, uh, after down conversion the typically the frequency will be within 100 megahertz. So, 100 megahertz that means, if you can design 4 times or 5 times of that say 500 megahertz uh, uh, megabit per seconds A to D converter then probably it will suffice that chain. The kind of A to D converter you can think of it in your chain. Okay. So, that is the overall scenario and this is the digitally controlled uh, egg, uh, oscillators supplied from the outside, uh, but technology pushes now how to make it an on chip oscillators inside uh, that is I will uh, give you some idea how to make it an on chip clock in the uh, in the today's technology. Then you have the two PLL one is for the RF and other for the IF regions it is a two stage frequency of conversions. There is another important thing is that your input signal is coming on the digital modulated one. So, you need two kind of a modulator one is called digital modulators and another the uh, another one is analog modulators. The digital modulator is actually modulate in a PSK or your according to your modulation scheme. Then this is has to be carried by a carrier. A digital modulation does not provide you that options to up convert it to a carrier signals. Then you need an analog mixing. So, you need a digital modulation scheme as well as the analog modulation scheme in a modern transceivers right. So, you need to have an A to D converter to digitize your input signal and then you modulate digitally to have on off keying or whatever. Finally, has to be carried over by a carrier by using a analog mixing and then you will uh, do the rest of the processing clear. So, this is the today's cell phone or the portable uh, radio communications systems I am talking about the physical layer. <coughs> Coming into the standards of power amplifier when I talk about the various kind of you are probably knowing in in the cell phone GSM, GPRS, H or UMTS now it is LTE. So, is linear technology evolutions here there are few things designing of power amplifier you require where is the peak average power ratio then peak to minimum ratio then how much is the dynamic power and so on dynamic range and so on. And what is this is very important in today's design is called the duty cycle. A duty cycle is a very good concept in power amplifier because power amplifier is basically a huge power hungry design. So, how to now minimize the power consumptions as if you know you are using a transmitter right. So, you are receiving the signals and you also transmit the signals by an antenna same antenna. So, at least you should guess that transmitter is not working all the time. So, what you can actually do you can actually make the duty cycle. So, your transmitter or the power amplifier may be on for say one eighth of the complete cycle or one fourth of the complete cycles. If you design for example, a 2 milliwatt today's design in a Zigbee or Bluetooth typical power consumption is 40.2 milliwatt okay. and that is a huge power consumptions. There is a huge power consumptions and if you want to reduce it to milliwatt 10 milliwatt and today's energy harvesting technology if you can calculate the kind of power budget it will go to sub milliwatt. And if you have a transmitter one say 1 kilometer or say 100 meter range then whatever be your design it will consume at least 10 milliwatt of power. So, then how can you reduce the power consumptions then the idea you should throw upon that the power amplifier should be switched on and off when it requires you turn on and rest of the time go to the sleep mode. So, then you can actually average power consumptions I have calculated it will be around micro watt. So, even it is possibility that you can make a sub milliwatt kind of a transceiver architectures by using a duty cycle approach right. These are very latest trends in transceiver design. So, typically this is the continuous one and definitely you can have much power consumptions where you have this uh, 1 by 8 or so on. So, this is the the kind of LTE the 
you know that the geophone which have the LTE technology that is called linear technology evolutions they made a very interesting approach they say that when you transmit the data okay then the data is coming with large number of handshaking protocol etc so you have a huge data at the left side of your main data and right side of your data the start stop bits and various protocol so that is con coming under this mac layer so they have actually made a protocol which will be much more simpler so that power consumption and the time delay is much less so if you calculate this today's geo uh, the capture this is the latest one lt technology where the minimum input signal is minus 119 uh, dbm so it is i calculate it is sub uh, nanowatt so beta error rate even they have a beta error rate pretty high uh, pretty low because they have actually squeezed all this mac layer and they are making the hardware so sensitive in that way so they are very very latest trends is like that that they they want to get rid of all those huge uh, uh, the, the data uh, over it uh, by reducing this complexity of the protocol so these are the things coming uh, in the today's trends in the uh, modern architecture so look at here the what are the key specification of the power amplifier there is a maximum output power now you make a point that when you design a power amplifier here efficiency is a strong function of the deliverable power the efficiency is varying with the output power so what is the maximum power you require and you calculate the efficiency at that delivered power because efficiency you don't take it uniform along the power so if the power delivered is x axis and efficiency in y axis it is not a constant line it is basically a variable line so there is a concept called power added efficiency so that efficiency is defined in terms of how much power at that point has been delivered clear so efficiency is not a constant entity but is varying with the power it delivered okay so that is the difference from a standard uh, efficiency calculations then I talk about the linearity linearity I will go a little bit of depth because you know that harmonic distortions and those kind of intermodulation products that too in a strong signal zone is quite detrimental in a transceiver design two tone I have mentioned that it will cause lot of intermodulation products and that will harm your transceivers so you have to make it linear when efficiency requirement is not so stringent stability stability issue is everywhere any in any amplifier is quite important because uh, if it oscillates in undesired frequency then it will create troubles radiation pattern so the power amplifier being generators therefore its radiation patterns whether it would interfere with other devices has to be uh, very carefully understood so you need some kind of a EMI EMC kind of a uh, mapping for your power amplifier before you put it into the market and the thermal emissions because there is a possibility that you can have hot spots you can have large power dissipations in the power amplifier footprints and that might cause the total failure of the chip therefore when you have an SOC kind of stuff where power amplifier integrated in your chip you have to be careful about this emission or the thermal emission characteristics that we this should dissipates the power very efficiently which will not generate any kind of a hot spot so let us have these three primary metrics how to make a power amplifier one is the output power efficiency and the linearity so that is one when you have a sinusoidal wave then you have the output of when the source resistance is mapped matched with the load then you have the output power v squared out by 2 rl but when the signal is modulated then there will be a modulation probability and that should come as a factors and to find out what will be the average output power so that is modulation index has to be found for what kind of modulations you are using and it should not the it does not include the power contributed by the harmonics or any unwanted sparse so that is an important part since it is a power delivering device 
So you have to be cautious about your power budget. So any power which is being spread to other harmonics or sparse that is basically wastage of power. Therefore, uh, harmonic cancellation technique or reduction of harmonics both things would be very much appropriate in a power amplifier design. So today's design actually if you look at the power amplifier architectures they are more talking about the linearization techniques of power amplifier. How to linearize the power amplifier that means in turn how to truncate the harmonics or subharmonics or their intermodulation or how to cancel them. So that the maximum output power is concentrated around the fundamentals. So that is the today's technology others otherwise I mentioned about the linearity and so on. So let me quickly give you that what is the most common architecture this is the uh, power added efficiency that means P out minus P in divided by P D C that tells you something difference from normal power amplifier. A power amplifier and a standard amplifier differs remarkably in a different operating principle. A power amplifier when it is actually uh, delivered at the output from where it draws the power. Your RF that is coming in your power amplifier having maximum microvolt or say uh, 0.1 or 100 microvolt or 1 millivolt kind of a peak to peak signals. It may be little more, but it is not drawing the power from the RF in. Actually it is drawing the power from the VDD from your biasing points. So power amplifier is a device which actually draws the power from your bias and then it also modulates with the frequency of your input RF signals. That is a power amplifier essentially the building blocks. So think of it how much power it is actually delivered P out and how much power it is, feed, it is actually uh, getting uh, from the input RF in it is very very small. So normally you know that power delivered by PDC is the efficiency of that but we are adding that power added efficiency where the input RF power is also coming into this structure but some it is pretty pretty low combinations it is in milliwatt that should be in a microwatt but efficiency is this. So normally we will consider the power added efficiency. So essentially DC to RF that means your VDD supply is, uh, is the power drawn from that translated into the RF frequency because the gate of the transistor is switched by a uh, frequency uh, from the RF in. So let me just quickly go into this 1 dB compression points all of you know this so I am not repeating that one also valid in case of power amplifier design because linearity has two aspects one is the 1 dB compression point and other is the intercept points and the intermodulation distortions. Now this intermodulation distortions would give rise to another very interesting things other than uh, other uh, discussed modules this is called adjacent channel power rejection ratio very very important suppose two channel are there and one of the channel if you look at the, the blue line and the green uh, and the and the red line you see that this is the channel okay. So you try to make the the red line which is the, the spectrum from the adjacent channel and where it is actually uh, roughly say minus 60 dB or 65 dB below the main channel which is the blue channel. That means your power amplifier the channel rejections that means neighborhood channel rejection is 60 dB below. So that is a safe limits if it is 30 dB above then you know that the channel interference will be more prominent. So when you design this kind of a masking is required. So the, a masking is a very important feature in a power amplifier design. So you will mask all these uh, spectrum components which is at the neighborhood of the adjacent channel. So at least 60 dB below. So that is a very important characteristics of any power amplifier apart from its power added efficiency or the uh, <coughs> linearity this is the AC pair or adjacent channel power efficiency otherwise your trans uh, receiver will or transmitter will receive others voice and signals. Then this is the standard IIP3 
third order intercept points and so on. And then I will go to the classification of RF which is called linear and switch mode. Both way the amplifier works. Okay. In case of the linear regions, you know that I can give you a cartoon or understanding what do mean by a linear and nonlinear part. Let us go into this. Suppose you have a switch okay, and the switch is being fed with an RF in clear and that is my VDD and say it is the ground. So, when VDD is flowing uh, is connected with that switch, the VDD is seeing the ground. So, current will now flow which is ID. But if it is an ideal switch what would happen? The voltage across the switch that is say point A B, V A B is what? 0. So, what will be my power consumption P will be I D into V A B and in this case it is 0. So, that is the power loss in the switch. Now, look at here when it is off in the off state this is the P on in the off state what is happening? Your I D equal to 0 into V A B which is the V D D and that is also 0. So, that is the basic principle of a power amplifier that means your transistor which is switched will either see the flow of current or see no flow of the current, but voltage swing will be 0 and V D D. Then ideally this is a power amplifier where you have the uh, maximum uh, <coughs> efficiency means the power drop across the switch is pretty 0. Now, if you look at here, now next concept is that suppose this is my fed device. So, if you look at the input signal and the output signal suppose this is my RF in goes. So, what will be the output? So, output current will follow this is my input voltage 0 pi 2 pi. So, the current will be something like that. So, what is this? It is called linear. So, your transistor is conducting from 0 to pi. So, you are having the product this is say I and this is the voltage. So, your product of this V into I is a non 0. So, the conduction angle is the same with the input signal. Therefore, in a switch the transistor is always on that means, the voltage here V D S this is the drain and the source that voltage drop with the current will be a non zero value because the conduction is 180 degree. Now, somehow if you can make it that I want to make. So, this is one which is an inefficient system. So, whatever be the output that will come out of that will always adding with some loss in this. So, some loss in this part and the rest of the part will come as a to the antenna. Okay. So, now I want to reduce the loss in this section. So, what is the approach is this that I will make my transistor drop here as less as possible or make the current and voltage in such a way that the product remains 0. Okay. So, that is the approach of a linear and switching mode thing. So, you understand these are linear operations of the amplifier and this is the switching mode operations of the amplifier clear. So, product should be important. I am sorry only 5 minutes I have. So, this is I have explained that and accordingly you know that you have to make your design to uh, for example, this is a VDD and the uh, a fed device 
and this is my RF in. How do you ensure the conduction angle of this fed device is 180 degree is bias. Suppose you bias the transistor above the threshold voltage what will happen? The transistor is always on. So, if there is an RF in you will get the corresponding V out as a simple amplifier common source kind of things. So, you will get this is my output voltage and this is the current. So, you will have always a little bit of power consumptions in your transistors yes or no sure. So, conduction angle is the same as the input signal, but coming into that and in that way you can calculate its efficiency and find out the efficiency is only 25 percent. When the conduction angle is the same 0 to pi then what is essentially means that it is basically a linear amplifier. So, I do not have any nonlinearity in the systems the output signal is exactly replicating my input signal phase. So, the frequency will be undistorted I will get the main frequency ok fundamentals and so on like an amplifier. Suppose the input signal is very small so that it is not going into the nonlinear region and so on so on. But when it goes to the switching case the different comes let me go. So, remember that it is 25 percent efficiency. I am going into the uh, class A it is an examples of the uh, linear amplifier and then you have bias state. So, trick bias is more than the VTH and once the output goes then you have this uh, capacitors and these capacitors is blocking your VDD to come to the output side and then also you have a huge choke mind it the choke is a bigger choke which is like a constant current source. This choke is a very fatty choke and that is known as the it is behave as a constant current source. There is one important consideration should be given over here one that this VDD is actually if there is a uh, changing in the modulation over here then maximum voltage across the inductor should be around twice VDD right minimum because initially the inductor behaves as an open circuit. So, the maximum difference in voltage will be 2 VDD even more than that. So, your fed device will be switched to a very huge voltage that might cause the breakdown of the MOS device. So, remember when you design a power amplifier make sure that you are using a thick gated or high power uh, 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 tolerance uh, MOS devices. Otherwise, if you just say that it is 1.8 at least it should be able to 2.5 times of 1.8 volt your transistor should be able to bear that shock because the inductor when switched it introduces more than 2 VDD at that instantaneous points. So, if it is your it will break then there is a possibility that it will the breakdown of your transistors. Next is this is my filter circuits what will be the role of that this L 2 and C 2 will actually and this combination of C 1 will introduce the kind of impedance matching from the output of the amplifier to the load. Not only that it will also fundamental frequency it will be allowed to the load and our, or our harmonics would be actually going to the ground. So, what I am saying that you are making a gate. So, suppose the amplifier would have all the harmonics. How do you make your filters that you allow the fundamentals which will go to your load and other harmonics either it will be grounded or it can be blocked. So, either you can block the harmonics or you can that is why it is in parallel to the load. So, other harmonics would actually see the ground path without disturbing the output. So, this is two way you can play with your harmonics. Harmonics may be blocked or harmonics may be grounded which will not go to your load. So, that is how this filter circuits this is known as the tank circuits of an amplifier is designed. 
Now, coming into that, you find in this way your efficiency is 1 by half or 50 percent. So, what we understood that how we do bias your transistors that defines the conduction angle, which finally gives you what will be the efficiency of this amplifier. So, now coming into this class B amplifier, in the class B amplifier, the V bias is just exactly with the threshold voltage same thing as the class A amplifier and in that case you can see that efficiency is just 50 percent. So, it is 50 percent on and rest it is off. So, you will have this one. So, it is called uh, only 50 percent time the VBS set to M 1 conduction. So, you will have the efficiency uh, <coughs> improved to it is the power if power delivered to the load is same as A and if you look at the efficiency is 78.5. So, how we do do that? It is a linear, but by what you have done? I say that conduction angle by varying the quantity now it is 50 percent. That means, if it is 0 pi 2 pi, you have met the biasing such a way that current is flowing only half of the cycle. So, rest of the rest of the cycle no current is flowing. So, you are actually power dissipations across the transistors would be at least 50 percent less. So, that will finally add up and you will find the efficiency has been increased to 78 percent 78. So, what you find that linear amplifier where efficiency will be high whereas, in case of nonlinear one let us see efficiency will be gradually let us see what will happen to the non. So, what I say that I just summarize that one when the conduction angle 2 pi equal to 2 pi equal to class A operations when it is less than 2 pi uh, phi pi to 2 pi it is class A B when it is exactly equal to phi that means, it is class B and when it is less than uh, greater than 0, but within pi then it is known as the class C. So, this is way class A class B and class A, B and C are being designated. So, if you look at that plot, this is a very important plot for a power amplifier idea that this is the RF power in the dB okay, that is delivered and this is the efficiency. What I said that if you want to improve your linearity, then you have to sacrifice your efficiency. Okay. Suppose this is A, A, B, B, C. So, these are more linear one, you have a conduction angle of 2 pi, okay. then you find your efficiency is very, very less, okay. uh, efficiency is less, but your uh, linearity is high, but gradually the efficiency increases as you are going to C, D, E and so on, but where you are finding the conduction angle is gradually lessened from even less than 90 degree, even then it will be uh, something of truncated that is pi by 4 kind of a conduction angle in that way. So, you remember this is 2 pi right, this is pi. So, this is uh, this is 0 to pi. So, if you look at here this pi by 2 somewhere here, then like that conduction angle if you reduce it you are improving your efficiency, but your uh, linearity is affected and it is out of power which is delivered to the load is as I understand the efficiency is and the output delivered power is not matched. So, you have to make some design where you have a considerable efficiency with with some desirable output levels. So, that is a very optimization problem. So, you can have a very huge efficiency, but at that efficiency your delivered output to the antenna is much lower that will not serve your purpose. So, that is the problem you need to set up. Now, coming to this the how we do actually class C amplifier time is short has to be done very carefully that analysis has to be done very carefully, where I have given you an expressions of how the conduction angle uh, can be varied to find out the IRF and from there you can calculate the efficiency that is a very important formula that is the maximum efficiency eta equal to twice phi is the conduction angle 4 and sin phi phi cos phi. So, that is actually you are maintaining you are actually controlling this conduction angle 2 phi is the twice the conduction angle that is 2 pi. 
So, it is half, half conduction angle. So, if you can vary it, then you can actually manipulate this eta and this variation of phi can be offered by proper biasing technique with respect to the threshold voltage. So, now if you look at the class C power amplifier, where it is basically a switching mode. So, you find the transistor is now replaced with a MOS transistors under large signal model. So, that means you are switching this transistor either on and off mode, but when the transistor is in off mode, then there will be a capacitance. So, whatever this big choke inductor is throwing the DC current is when the transistor is off, that means the switch is off, okay. then that means the current will actually charge the capacitors across the transistors, which is node cap and also a part of it will go as an RF, which is being filtered by the fundamentals and fed to the low. So, this is a typical uh, schematics of a class E power amplifier. Okay. And when it is switch is on, then you know that current is flowing through the transistors okay? and that will kill some of your power, because you need how much power. So, now look at here, I need my maximum power to be delivered at the load and minimum power to be dissipated in this region. So, that is the approach. So, how the efficiency, how much power being drawn from BDC efficiently at the fundamental frequency. How can I do that? I have this current path. One path is going to my load side, other part is going to the transistors and the parasitic cap. So, I have to reduce this part as much as possible, but there is a crying need because transistor needs to be on. So, it will have some current always to the transistors, then you make time interleave. So, you make the switch in such a way that one time the transistor is completely off and other one. So, the conduction angle by varying it, so you can have that switching things what we have explained that where the VDS into ID will be 0, so efficiency will increase. So, you can have higher efficiency in a nonlinear switching type 1, but there is a big but which is the thing that suppose you have a switch. Okay. Suppose you have a switch and you are getting the voltage. So, if the switch is on and off like that, then what will be the output? The output will be something like a square wave. So, my output will be square wave yes or no. Suppose you have this kind of switch. So, output will not a sine wave, but it will be like a square wave on and off yes or no. If you take the Fourier spectrum of that, then you will have all kind of harmonics. Okay, the even harmonic terms will come. So, that is the, the, the cost you are paying. That is when you have a pure sinusoidal signals, then the fundamentals will come along with little bit of harmonics because of the distortions. But here it will entirely different, you are getting a square wave okay? and the square wave gets means you have third harmonic contents. All the energy is now spreaded over the third harmonic, fifth harmonic, seventh harmonic and so on. So, this square wave I am giving you the idea that how this can be interleaved because this third harmonic or the fifth harmonic actually you need this filter to block those, only the fundamentals will see the load. So, understand the challenge. The, I am creating a square wave and that square wave consists of all those harmonic components, but I will make my filter in such a way, my harmonic, even odd harmonic components will be blocked or being fed to the ground and rest of this will actually the fundamental, primary fundamental components will go to the load side. So, that is the observations to that and this way you can change the conduction angle and this is the final class C. So, suppose this is my drain current, the green one and this is my the VDD that is the voltage across this transistor. So, you see that the current and the voltage they are not overlapping. So, I can say the product of that is only in this region little bit of overlapping list or this the region, rest of the things is, is pretty less. So, this way just by changing the current and voltage overlapping region by changing the conduction angle, you can actually improve the efficiency of the system, but at the cost of linearity. 
why you have changed why at the cost of linearity because it is a switching transistors that will not introduce an harmonic that will introduce square wave which will essentially give you the odd harmonics which is the reason for the non linearity of a power amplifier okay so efficiency and linearity is if i look at this um, um, profile it will be clear to you now i have given you an examples how to design a class c power amplifier please go through it then you can calculate what will be the capacitance and so on this is the complete design of a class c power amplifier and now uh, there is two important aspects i would say a very uh, this is my very latest uh, i have not yet published so anyway so what i am saying that uh, class c power amplifier in a single stage when you want to make the transistors in a switching mode then the input signal is not big enough to drive your transistor to the large signal one so you need a driver stage any amplifier any class c amplifier you will find there is a two stage or three stage power amplifier boosting is required so that kind of so you can actually make a class c class c driven two class c at different gain to drive class one class c is driving another class c another thing which is comes to my intuitions that whether we can make a more linear uh, more non linear amplifier which will drive a class c amplifier the idea is that if you look from the physics model that if you have a complete chaotic system okay you have lot of noises in this but if we introduce another noise with some phase there is a possibility that noises might cancel so idea is that suppose you have the non linearity all this harmony is coming in the stages then you can create a known non linearity in the systems and then superpose them so that your harmonics might get cancels so that is called harmonic cancellation techniques and this is some results has come out so i have class c class c driven and more non linear is class f so class f class c driven so then i found very interesting things that my linearity is better when i have driven it to a more non linear systems than a linear system so this is the 2.4 gigahertz class class c amplifier and this is the class f driven amplifier and if you look at here this is my vdd and this is the current so you can find that the current there is still to be tuned up this is a very new new uh, just uh, one week results so you'll find that the peak of the current is appearing where the voltage is not appearing so you can say we say uh, switching the conduction angle has been uh, modified in such a way that it will give the more efficiency in the systems and then you can calculate the efficiency achieved is 41.57% uh, <coughs> and so on power dissipation is this and this is called class c class c driven amplifiers so you find that the it is the current is uh, the peak is coming a, where the voltage is very very low so that is i want right you need the uh, current where it is picking up your voltage should be as low as possible so the product is power dissipation which is becoming very very less so that is the kind of things so you know that this problem will come up so you have to fine tune your circuits and like that this is not this very latest that's one two weeks before so this is the how the works and you will find now you know that uh, people are talking about various kind of uh, linearization techniques called back off technique pre distortion cartesian feedback and polar feedback and so on so one of the important areas you can think of it called digitally assisted power amplifier design where actually if you have a modulator and a power amplifier you can introduce some kind of a pre distortions by dsp suppose the power amplifier amplifier having a transfer function of say 10 hyperbolic function then you can introduce some kind of a uh, inverse transfer function here and put the signal in this so that approach is that this suppose the gain is like that modulator will be the reverse gain and that will be straight in enough so if you have a transfer function of your amplifier if the signal is passes through the inverse transfer function of that then it is fed to the amplifier probably that should improve your linearity of that this is one of the important uh, uh, approach route coming up in the design and you know that 
Bram Nauter is one of the uh, good friend um, also in the University of Twente. So, what is his plan that let this power amplifier uh, having RF in and this is the first time he introduced that VDD let this VDD is being modulated by a low frequency modulation which is your modulating signal is actually modulating the VDD and RF in is modulating the gate voltage and that actually he, he thinks that it can improve the, uh, the linearity of the system that is harmonic cancellation will be there when you can modulate the VDD. Actually the power amplifier design let me end with that you know that Mercedes Benz or BMW if you go to 1 crore uh, those kind of car you have the vibration uh, you know the shock absorbers. So, those shock absorbers getting the idea from here how this harmonics when you actually drive a car then you will talk to the uh, automobile engineer they will say that if the vibration is more than 5 to 7 hertz then you and the driver will find dizziness. Uh, so, to avoid that you know when it is vibration there is a spring uh, this Macpherson or some kind of a shock absorber it will vibrate and create lot of harmonics. So, they know some technique okay, to cancel those vibrations. So, that is called the harmonic cancellation technique introduced in the automobile engineering with this concept. So, they take the sample the output of the spectrum from the from the power amplifier feedback by by changing its phase. So, that the other harmonics gets cancelled uh, in opposite phase only the fundamentals gets up and the fundamentals within the tolerance region or in your case within the desired frequency range. So, that is the overall scenario of a power amplifier design time is very less. So, I have glimpses or I would say that glided to that, but then my next design will be the design of frequency synthesizer and I will start this part. Uh, the power added efficiency will be close to the efficiency uh, because input power few micro watts. So, P out minus few micro watt will be much less but power added efficiency is a 22.5 percent efficiency in a class A B kind of thing 25 percent 22.5 percent is the typical power added efficiency of the class A or class linear kind of a power amplifier. Theoretically you should get 100 percent efficiency in a non-linear switching type of amplifier, but what you can find is 78 to 78.5 power added efficiency. So, that is the the typical figure, but the kind of distortions you, you can uh, remove in a linear type of amplifier is much better than in case of a nonlinear switching type of amplifier. So, that is the important you know that optimization or trade off in between the linearity and the power added efficiency. Okay.